Good morning. morning. I got a feeling we're in the right place today. So, I'm going to sing a unity standby song. (laughs) This is a full-on unity song. Now, I've sung this song at Centers for Spiritual Living, which used to be Church of Religious Science, and they go, where did you get that song? That's a great song. We don't have a song like that. It's a unity song. So repeat after me. I am free. I am unlimited. I am free. I am unlimited. There are no chains that bind me. I am free, I am unlimited right now. I am free, I am unlimited right now. I am free, I am unlimited. There are no chains that bind me. I am free, I am unlimited right now. very simple, but it's very powerful. Let's do that verse again. I am free, I am unlimited, there are no chains that bind me. I am free, I am unlimited, right now. I am free, I am unlimited, there are no chains that bind me. these free unlimited people and let's sing we are free we are free we are unlimited there are no chains that bind us we are free we are unlimited right now right now we are free take a couple of seconds here and think about all the people that can't be here this morning or all those people that are in other spiritual centers we know this is true for everyone no matter who they are where they are and they are us and we are them you are free send it out you are free you are unlimited there are no chains that bind you. You are free. You are unlimited right now. You are free. You are unlimited. There are no chains that bind you. You are free. You are unlimited right now. First verse, one more time. Put your hand over your heart if you want. I am free, I am unlimited. There are no chains that bind me. I am free, I am unlimited right now. I am free, I am unlimited. There are no chains that bind me. I am free, I am unlimited, right now, right now. And that is what I am, it's what you are, and in truth that's what everyone on this planet is. Some of us know it, some of us don't know it, but it's the truth of who we are all the time. Welcome to Unity on the Avenue. We are unapologetically inclusive, which means nobody can walk in that door that isn't part of our group already and that we don't welcome. 
we have a special guest who's actually going to talk to you about the wonderful concert you get to be a part of next Saturday night. Clint, it's all yours. Uh, we're glad to be here. Uh, good to see some familiar faces. And uh, I'd like to mention some things about the band. The band started in 2009. And without me, I wasn't there. And it was a, a veteran. He came into town in 2008. And he wanted to, he, in the military, for a couple of years, he played in the military band. And he wanted to start a big band. And so he calls this a big band. It's actually a little big band. <laughs> uh, the big bands of the 20s and 30s and even the 40s had like 17 people. We have 12 musicians and one singer. But we're fortunate to have a fine singer and the 12 of us actually like each other, which is nice too. That doesn't always happen among musicians. So anyhow, it's called Serenade in Blue. I've been a member of the band since about 2010 roughly, I think. And it's all her fault because we had moved here and she thought her husband needed something musical to do because I'm a retired band director and she thought I was lacking. Now I'm more than busy because I'm also with that band, Serenade in Blue, Zing, which is a larger band, and I direct the North Dakota State American Legion Band. So it's time for my third retirement one of these days. <laughs> but it's going to happen. Anyhow, we're, I wouldn't say we're a big band. Let me tell you kind of the stuff we play. I'll give you that. Uh, brought us a little list of stuff. Not that I forget tunes, but just to show you the kind of mixture. Uh, we play kind of classic contemporary, put it that way. Like, we, we're going to start out with Shiny Stockings, Count Basie. You're nobody till somebody loves you, made famous by Dean Martin. Uh, Swonderful, George and Ira Gershwin from one of their musicals. Getting Sentimental, Glenn Miller. I've heard that song before, Harry James, the famous uh, English trumpet player. Uh, Moon River, Henry Mancini. Crazy, Patsy Cline. Now that's a way big different, <laughs> we go from Patsy Cline to Count Basie. Margaritaville, and of course, the guy that did Margaritaville, Jimmy Buffett, died just this week. So you can bet we're gonna play Margaritaville. But uh, we're really pleased to be back here, and we're thankful for you to sponsor this again. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a story of what music can do for people. Now, I told a story last year, I think, and if those of you, how many of you were here last year when I, yeah, well, some of you weren't. I'll have to tell you both of them. I can take a little time. Uh, with the North Dakota Legion Band, I've been in there for 38 years. I started out playing trombone and I'm the director, which means I'm not good enough to play anymore. <laughs> so you know, anybody can wave their arms, but you gotta be able to play. And uh, we, when I got in, we had two World War I members. And uh, one passed away, one went into a nursing home for advanced Alzheimer's. And we were in Fargo, North Dakota, and somebody came with, with the idea, Let's go play for him. So we set the band up about a block away. We came marching down the road playing our marching song, and his daughters had him sitting out there, was hoping that maybe he'd like it. He wakes up. Now here's a guy who wasn't speaking. He knew, greeted all 40 of us by name. He, he knew every song we played. His two daughters were just sitting there bawling their heads off because for one, for one day, they had their father back. Next morning, it was gone again. But the power of music. And the band that we're gonna play with, you, you know, when, that you'll hear next week, uh, Serenade in Blue, the same thing happened there. We, we play out at De Chico's, and it's, it's spelled De Cicio, so if you wanna look it up, it's not, he pronounced it De Chico's, but he's Italian, and the way he wants to pronounce it is the way he can pronounce his name, so. Anyhow, we play out there once a month, third Saturday of every month, and but it would be about two years ago, uh, you know, we always have a table. She drags her friends in to give us a better audience. And uh, this was a friend of a friend brought their father, and a retired band director. And he had not spoken for months. And he had an advanced uh, case of Parkinson's. And I guess that can be a problem sometimes. He starts listening. He starts talking. He goes out and dances. He hadn't done anything but barely move for almost two years. Then he comes up to me and starts talking shop because he was an ex-band director as I was high school band director. And the power of music has a way of moving people. And that's why we do this thing. Uh, we're not the greatest band in the world, but people seem to like us, they respond, 
and I hope you will too. And thank you for having us, and thank you, Pam. You know, ju just a few words. Um, so some of you knew that my husband had what's called frontotemporal disorder, FTD. That's the same disease that Bruce Willis has. And along with that, Bruce Willis also has aphasia, which is the verbal, the ability to speak. Um, and um, I was just reading the other day that music touches the right side of the brain, speech touches the left side of the brain, and I experienced the same thing with my husband. He hadn't spoken in about a year, and when, his, when my, uh, my daughter-in-law came, David, um, she started singing to him, sunshine on my shoulders, and he started singing with her, mouthing the words. So um, music, I think, is very powerful, and it touches my soul, and my husband and I had supported live music for over 30 years, and this is why I do what I do. Um, but on top of that, dancing, I think, is an expression of the music. And um, I, I really feel that there is a spiritual connection with the music and the dancing and the movement to the music. So um, I've invited, after I got the email yesterday, I invited some Arthur Murray friends. Um, so if you enjoy watching Dancing with the Stars, you may enjoy some of the dancing that the students are doing. Um, I don't know how many are showing up, but um, I think that we've, we've got a pretty nice head count. So Ken has to give us enough room on the floor here. Thank you. Thank you. So I invite you to repeat uh, Unity's foundation in faith together. There is only one power and one presence in the universe and in my life. God the good omnipotent. And Eustain is our chaplain for the day. Allow your chairs to support you. Take some deep breaths and let the cares and the concerns of the week just go and prepare to receive our message for today and our thoughts for today and prepare to be embraced in joy. If you'd like, close your eyes and breathe. So my beloved, never were we so truly one. We are learning that the very air we breathe is charged with the life force. Therefore, knowing this, realize that as you breathe, you breathe in healing, you breathe in power, health and beauty, strength and joy. Breathing out again, you give your breath and all it contains forth to all your world. All its powers are of the spirit and there is no separation from the great oneness. So shall we go forth living largely and joyously throughout the days before us, filling each hour with loving service. This is the only service that is wholly acceptable and the only service that is truly of the spirit and not of the self. When you attain this joy, all life will be singing throughout your every cell. The world is so in need of quietness and joy today and there can only be found within the heart of each of you this joy. 
We release these thoughts to the universe. And so it is. Amen. So I have this Buddhist fable that I really like. Um, perhaps you're not familiar with what a fable is. A fable is just a story that has a moral to it or sees things in a new perspective. Um, and uh, I read a quote by Joseph Campbell once who said, fables aren't real, but they're true. So I like fables. So the characters in this fable are a farmer, the farmer's horse, the farmer's neighbor, another horse, the farmer's son, and the army. It's a cast of thousands. And I decided to take this fable that I really like and turn it into a song. Um, and I need your help because we get to sing the part of the farmer, the wise farmer. So I'll sing a line and you sing it back. This is how the chorus goes. Not good, not bad. What's next? Who knows? Not good, not bad. Then the last line we all sing together. We'll see how it goes. The Buddhists are kind of maddening because eh, it could be this way, it could be that way. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the story. The farmer said, my horse ran away. His neighbor said, ooh, that's bad. Now how will you plow your field each day? And here's what the farmer said, not good, not bad. What's next? Who knows? Not good, not bad. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. So Buddhist. Well, that horse came back in a day or two with a beautiful mare that he led. The neighbor cheered, how lucky for you. But then again, the farmer said, not good, not bad. What's next? Who knows? Not good, not bad. We'll see how it goes. Well, when the farmer's son tried to ride that new horse, he fell off and broke his leg instead. Oh. The neighbor cried, it's a disaster, of course. But once again, the farmer said, not good, not bad. What's next? Who knows? Not good, not bad. We'll see how it goes. Then the army came to draft every youth in the land. The son, with his leg, was rejected. The neighbor said, what a fortunate man. The farmer shrugged, then he said, not good, not bad. What's next? Who knows? Not good, not bad. We'll see how it goes. So don't jump to conclusions or judge a book by the cover we don't know what we don't know it ain't over till it's over 
Not good, not bad. Rain falls, wind blows. Relax, step back. We'll see how it goes. Not good, not bad. We'll see. I particularly asked Robert to sing that song. Um, some of us went out to Yuma, Colorado. Great place if you want to go out there. A car museum if you care about old cars. And Robert sang that song, which put it in my mind again. So I asked him to sing it for you because um, it's a story I've used many, many times when on in different talks. On um, August 18th, if you happen to read the, good, the New York Times, you may have noticed this headline, which I clicked on and read and um, have lived with for a couple of weeks. Why does everyone feel so insecure all of the time? So a woman named Astria Taylor uh, who's an organizer, a filmmaker, and the author of a book that's about to come out called The Age of Insecurity, Coming Together as Things Fall Apart, wrote this essay. And she's talking about contemporary economic life and each of our place in it and how the feeling of insecurity is prevalent no matter what the social class of the person is. So no matter whether you live on Social Security or whether you have a fabulous 401k and collect a lot of money, most of the people feel insecure most of the time. And it's interesting that there is no dollar amount that makes people feel secure. So I'm going to say, if you're the person living on a little bit of Social Security, you might think, oh my God, if I had $100,000 in the bank, I would just, I would know I was fine. But the people with $100,000 in the bank, they, they feel insecure. And they think, well, if I had a half a million, maybe a million, if I just had that invested, then I would absolutely feel secure. And millionaires need more, and we watch billionaires try to acquire even more because they're afraid it might not be enough. Isn't it interesting that there is no line of demarcation on what is enough? However, it varies with all the people in the room. Now, I'm going to give you another interesting statistic to me. Now, when I say interesting, of course, I mean I think it's interesting. You may not like it at all. But the British political theorist Mark Neoclis has noted that the modern word insecurity didn't exist in the English language until the 17th century. Now, if you think, you may know what happened in the 17th century. Started with the printing press. It's about the Industrial Revolution. Now, prior to the Industrial Revolution, we had a lot of poor people. They were serfs, they were peasants, but they didn't use or think about the word insecurity. So it took creating a world of demarcation marked by what? Marked by money that allowed people to suddenly feel insecure. So, and people who manufacture things had a wonderful insight 
around 1930. Discontented people buy more stuff. Think about that for a moment. If I just had this, then I would be happy. If I just could go there on vacation, then I would be happy. If my house were decorated this way, I could be happy. If my clothes had a certain label, then, then I could be happy. So the insecurity that exists in our world exists because of stuff. So is insecurity good or is insecurity bad? We'll see how it goes. So it's interesting because we talk about inequity and inequity is a provable fact. You know, we know that some people don't have as much as other people. But the insecurity part of it is the part that I find to be fascinating. I think the feeling of insecurity is really an opportunity. Unlike inequity, insecurity is more than a binary of haves and have-nots. It's university universality require, reveals the degree to which unnecessary suffering is widespread. So it's not limited to those of us sitting in this room, whether or not your phone dings, it's okay. Or it's not limited to the United States. It happens in Europe, happens in South America, it doesn't matter. Because of our own desire to have enough stuff, to have the right stuff, to have the right amount of money. So at the same time, you know, I read all this stuff and then I sort of collect it and I stick it here and there and we're in between a series, which we will get to on the 17th of September. We're going to go to Essential Spirituality. Those of you who like to read ahead and get the book, that's where we're headed, which is going to use the different world religions to um, show us a pathway to feeling better about ourselves. But we aren't there yet. And so I thought, I'm going to talk about that article from the New York Times that just niggled at me all the time. And then I was reading the Centers for Spiritual Living, Richard Rohr's um, daily meditation that he sends out. And James Findlay is one of the teachers down there. He was, he's an author, a clinical psychologist, and a former Trappist monk from the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky, which is an awesome place. And he, in an article, talked about becoming a mystic. And he said that the question is, and this is a quote taken straight from the article, how do we as spiritual beings feel secure in an insecure world? And so his article is a direct answer to the New York Times, and I know they didn't arrange to put it together, so I did. So what James Finley is talking about is living the contemplative life. And if I were going to ask a question and give you an opportunity to answer it, which I always do and I'm willing to do if any of you have any great desire to contribute, but most of the people who like to talk aren't here today. <laughs> and I promised people if they would sit on the inside circle, I wouldn't poke any of them. So what do you think of when you think of a contemplative life? Are you imagining living in a convent, in a monastery, in a cave? What do you think about 
is a contemplative life. Um, kind of tied in with what you were talking about earlier, I think a contemplative life for me means turning my phone off <laughs> or my TV off and then just thinking about things and, and um, because I walk, with, I walk with apprehension. So I learned a couple of years ago or a few years ago to just stop and go, all right, what, what's, what's the problem? Not, don't just sit there feeling uneasy. Why are you feeling uneasy? And you know, what can you do about it? And it really made a huge difference in my life to just stop everything and say, so what is it exactly? And a lot of times I can figure out what that is, sometimes I can't, but at least I'm contemplating on it and figuring it out and not just letting it walk around being worried or anything. So I guess that's like personal contem com com whatever. Contemplative, yes. Contemplative life. <laughs> so James Finley says, the contemplative way of life is so called because it's a way of life devoted to the contemplative experiences. So this has to work on Tuesday morning. It has to work Wednesday night at 3 o'clock when you wake up. It has to work all the time. And what James goes on to say is our started, starting place is to observe carefully and pay close attention. Most of the things that we notice, we notice in passing on our way to something else. Think about your trip to the center today. How many things did you pass? What did you really see? Did you see the beautiful blue sky? Did you happen to see a child playing outside? You saw people walking their dogs. You can't get in here without that. Did you enjoy that beautiful animal? Sometimes something catches our eye <coughs> and draws our attention. And we're drawn for a moment to ponder or reflect on what caught our eye. Why did that moment touch my heart? Anytime your heart's touched, it's a contemplative moment. And you can choose to deliberately look for those moments. And what is so extraordinary about the moments when you're caught is that there's nothing extraordinary happening. It's an everyday moment seen in a different way. You may have watched the blue moon the other night. You may have walked outside deliberately to see it because we won't have another one until 19, or 19, yeah, right, 2037. Now, I'm guessing some of us in this room won't be here in 2037. So that was our last chance to see a blue moon, and yet there's a full moon every month. Do you see it? Do you experience it? It's just a moon. If you're away from the city, it's just a bunch of stars in the sky that you can't see because of the light. It's just the primal stuff of life that you see in an unexpected fashion, something that catches you and gives you this moment of ah, 
all's right in the world, life is wonderful. Something that broke through for a moment your feelings of insecurity. Here in this unforeseen defenselessness, because it catches you unaware, is the cosmic dance of God. That present moment just the way it is in its deepest actuality, the fullness of the union with God we seek. We choose a contemplative way of life when we choose to recognize and return to those moments of awakening. These moments pass, and the real question for us then is, what happens next? Too often, unfortunately, nothing happens next. The gate of heaven opened for a moment, and you were there, and you saw it in a baby's giggle, in a beautiful scene, but already we've moved beyond that moment. We leave that feeling of, ah, I belong here. I am one with the universe. I am free. I am unlimited. And it's gone. And we go back to, how are we going to pay the bills? We can say to ourselves, I don't like living in insecurity. I don't like being excluded from the kingdom of heaven. We get to choose to be aware. On Facebook, our profound spiritual tool, um, I found a new thing. Have you heard about glimmers? So this is the little thing. If you want to find it, it's on my Facebook page. Have you heard about glimmers? They are the opposite of triggers. A glimmer is a tiny micro moment of happiness, a sign of hope. Once you begin to look for them, they will start to appear everywhere. A contemplative moment or a glimmer? Which one do you want to have be a part of our life? Brother Lawrence told us that chop wood, carry water before enlightenment, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. But what do you see while you're chopping wood each day? What do you see when you're driving to work? What do you see when you walk your dog? What do you see when you look at a room full of children? Eustain and I were talking about sometimes we hear a lot of noise. But do we see the glimmer on that child's smile? Some of us like to find our contemplative moments when we are outside, exercising, riding your bike. What do you see? Some of us like to exercise. There's that moment of euphoria that hits. If you're a person who likes to exercise, is that your glimmer? Something that's present in the rhythm of activity. Years ago when I first was walking into a Unity Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I sat down to meditate, I had a terrible time. I'm, I tend to be a busy doing person. I know you can't tell that from looking at me, but that's what's true. And you know where I first experienced meditation? Two places, 
sweeping. We had big wooden decks around our house, which was on top of Mount Sequoia and looked across the Ozark Mountains. And I would go outside to sweep the leaves and acorns off. Sweeping is a very meditative, rhythmic activity. My former husband wore white shirts to work, or the equivalent blue ones, whatever button-down collar was, to work. I used to iron those. Ironing is a very rhythmic activity. Most of us don't iron. I don't iron anymore. But rhythmic activities, which is probably why Brother Lawrence found God washing dishes. We have an opportunity to disappear into the beautiful moments of our lives. We have an opportunity to glimpse the face of the divine wherever we least expect it. If we give up our need to control everything and simply live with not knowing, live with what's happening isn't good or bad, because it's not over yet. We tend to think there's a period at the end of the center sentence. And this particular moment in time is dreadful. Now, are there dreadful things happening? Yes. Not good, not bad. We'll see how it goes. What we get to remember well, the one other thing I was going to tell you about my own kind of contemplation. If you th watch in the, about June, and you live here in Colorado, the cottonwood fluff blows all over. And those moments of contemplation are like the fluff. It comes in, and it drifts out. We're the only ones who can capture that moment and keep it, keep it with us. The book of Matthew, chapter 16, 13 through 20, is when Jesus is actually telling us, each and every one of us, who we really are. This is what it says. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people, everyone, the crowd, say that the Son of Man is? In other words, he's saying, who do they say Jesus is? But what we all know is that each of us is the Son of Man. And his disciples said, some say that he's the reincarnation of John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or some of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but you who are with me, who do you say that I am? Simon P Peter answered, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the daughter and son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you let loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. In unity we teach that each of us is the divine 
expression of God. Not one of us is all that God is, but each of us is a facet of God. If we remember that we're a facet of God, if we search for the contemplative moments, the glimmers in our life, and we focus on those rather than on the things that take us down, we too can live in the kingdom of heaven. So I invite you to simply <sighs> take a deep breath and let it out. Choosing to focus on your breath and perhaps one of the moments when you too had a glimmer, a contemplative moment of the divine. whether it was natural beauty, whether it was the kindness of a stranger, whether the, it was the giggle of a baby. We have the power to choose where we put our focus. We often think, we don't. We often think we must dwell on fixing whatever is wrong in this world. None of us can fix this world. But in choosing where we focus, we energetically change the world. We send out moments of love, moments of light, moments of prayer, moments of hope. Hope to the hopeless. Hope to the people who are in severe pain. Hope to the people who are starving. Hope to the people who are dying in war-torn places on this earth in this moment. We choose to sit in this circle and exert our power, our love, our energy into the world so that those who feel hopeless for a moment might feel our hope might feel the heaven that we choose to send to them. We know that we are a facet of God and we choose to focus that love and that light into the world. We choose to do it now together in the stillness. We have the power, we have the grace, we have the strength, we have the courage, we have the wisdom, we have the love, and in this moment we are alive and we choose to contribute the gifts that we have to the energy of this planet we call home. We send it forth with love and light. We send it forth as a blessing that each individual may in this moment have their own glimmer of hope.
and so it is, and so we let it be. Amen. This is our opportunity to share. Um, some of us are consistent givers and we give online all the time. Some of us give cash, some of us write checks. Some of us actually use this wonderful little device called the Square. And it allows you to put your credit card, just tap it right there, and it will send you a receipt so that Uncle Sam knows you donate money. So any way you choose to do that is a way that we choose to bless. So I invite you to hold your hands together in blessing as we repeat our offertory affirmation. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. So here's a song I wrote to help me grab onto those contemplative moments. <laughs> the glimmer moments. Well, I might look ridiculous Get 
head in the flow Let ourselves go We might as well All right, we're blessing all of our children in absentia. You might write their name on your prayer request slip, don't forget that, and put it in the prayer box in the back. And um, let's bless the inner child in each one of us. You are loved, special, and important. We see you and bless the divine being that you are. And let's end with our prayer for protection, knowing the light of God surrounds us. I am that light. The love of God enfolds us. I am that love. The power of God protects us. I am that power. The presence of God watches over us. I am that presence. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. It's not good, it's not bad, it just is. Come downstairs and join us for lunch. We have food for a crowd, so you have to eat a lot today. I am free. No chains that bind me I am free I am unlimited Right now, right now Yes, I am free I am 